All right, let's get started. So last week um, we were and we ended talking about uh, uh, multiplication algorithm, and we had and we looked at the and the naive grade school multiplication algorithm you had. Um, we called it mult xy, and we you know we wrote it down formally. We analyzed its running time. And uh, we wrote down this, uh, um, sorry, we derived this running time easily. It wasn't, it wasn't a recursive algorithm, so we could just argue about number of steps taken by the for loop. There, really, the point that I wanted to, to, to I used that example to illustrate this loop invariant technique, which is going to be on your next homework. Uh, and this is a technique to prove correctness of uh, iterative algorithms such as this one. Um, so just so you have things in perspective, we are um, doing multiplication algorithms, but it's, it's really just like a gateway that we learn other things. So here I wanted to teach you about loop, uh, loop invariant. Um, then this n squared algorithm, we asked if we can do faster. And I tried to design a faster algorithm for you last time. Um, uh, this was the algorithm, and now we're going to use this as a gateway to analyze the running time of a recursive algorithm to talk about how to do that. So let's look at this algorithm here. We've got sort of the, the main idea was to take X and to think of it as having a left half and a right half, and the same thing for Y thinking of as a, a left half and a right half. And then, of course, we could just write down x as a function of the two halves. So the right half plus the left half shifted left by n over two bits. Same thing with y. Then if we were to multiply x times y, we could plug those um, uh, in and distribute them and get this formula for x times y where P1 is going to be XL, the left half of X times the left half of Y. P2 is the right halves multiplied together. So this guys. And then we have the left of X times the right of Y and vice versa. This gave an immediate algorithm, uh, which I jotted down here. Um, so we compute P1 recursively and P2 we compute recursively. Uh, we compute these two products also recursively. And then we compute this formula to return our value of multiplication. Okay, so what is the running time of this? Uh, this is a recursive algorithm. We're gonna, so we're gonna write down what's called the recurs, uh, recursion relation. It's gonna look like this. We're gonna say, all right, there's, some non-recursive work that this function does and some recursive calls that it makes. So let's start with the recursive calls. How many recursive calls does it do? One, two, three, four. So we have four times some recursive call, the time taken by that recursive call. Now, T of n is the time taken by a call on input of n bits here. What, what about in the recursive call? How many bits are being passed to that recursive call? Well, we'd said XL is just half, uh, the left half of X. So the number of bits is half the number of bits. So we put here n over two. This is the recursive component of the relation. And now we have the non-recursive component. So what happens in the non-recursive part? Well, uh, 
these are just recursive calls, the, this is where some computation that's non-recursive is needed. We have an addition. So we have three additions. And we have these guys, two shifts. Why do I say shifts? Because it's really, it's multiplying, right? Two of n times P1. Well, multiplying two of n by anything is not, uh, you don't have to go through any fancy multiplication algorithm. Multiplying by two of n is the same as shifting by n bits. All right, so these are really shifts by n bits and by n over two bits. Now, how many, how many does, how long does these, uh, do these operation take? take? It's data n, and that's what we covered earlier, that addition, like this addition of n bit integers is theta n time. Uh, same thing for shift of n over two bits or n bits, this is theta n time. Thus, the total number of non-recursive work is theta n. This is runtime of mult two. Any questions? Okay, so I mean, great, but this really doesn't tell us what the runtime is. It gives us a formula for it, but it, it doesn't say it's like n squared or n. Like we can't, we don't know if it's better than n squared. So how do we solve these recurrence relations? We saw one earlier with the Fibonacci numbers and there we kind of got lucky because uh, it reduced to something we proved. Today, I want to give you a, a, a kind of a, a more general technique called the recursion uh, tree technique for solving, um, for solving these recurrence relations. So let's, let's do this. Uh, we start by drawing a recursion tree. We kind of saw this already with Fibonacci numbers and uh, on the homework that's due today. So um, in, on the top, we have, uh, we have um, a, a, a call to a function and the input size is n, right? T of n. That generates, in this case, four recursive calls, each one of size n over two. Now, each one of those generates its own recursive calls. Now the n over two, when it when within n over two, when it invokes its recursion, now it halves the input size. So the, the, the next input size down is n over four. Okay. Same thing for here. For here though, I won't write it out. And, and this sort of, this continues going down until we hit, hit some kind of base case. Um, it usually doesn't matter. We can assume it's a node size problem of size one. The runtime of our algorithm, well, um, okay, let's, let's take a step back. So what do we know about the street? First, what is, it, what is its height in terms of n? Well, every level we reduce the input size by two until we get to one. So what is that in terms of n? How many times do we, can we reduce the input n by half before getting to one? Log n, right? 
log base two of n. Um, then what is the branching factor in this tree? In other words, how many children does every node have? Four. Um, now we get a little more interesting. So at depth K, how many subproblems are there? And depth k, so at the top level we'll say is k equals zero. The next one is k equals one. The next one is k equals two, and so on. Uh, yeah, four to the k. Right, so initially, you know, you can double check these. So you plug in k equals zero, you should get one. So you plug in k equals zero, you do get one. And if you plug in k equals one, you should get four. And that's what you get. So notice every time each node splits into four new nodes. So you're multiplying by four, the number of nodes as you go down a level. And that's why uh, depth k, the number of subproblems there, is four to the k. Okay. And finally, at depth k, what is the size of the subproblems? I'm asking about this number as a function of k. Yeah. One almost n over two to the k. And so, uh, because what happens each time we again, we, we each time we half the size of the problem. So n and over two and over four. So after, so we, we multiply, we put k twos here. And so the size of the problem is n over two k. You can plug things in to make sure you didn't make an off by one error or something like this at k equals zero, we expect n. So n over two to the zero is n. And you can try k equals two, we should get n over four. And if we plug in k equals two here, we do get n over four. So that's good. Um, okay, so this is like when we're doing the recursion tree technique, we want to first uh, calculate, like write down these four numbers, and then we'll use them to argue about the, uh, the running time. Yeah. I haven't mentioned the theta of n. That's uh, right. So, so far, theta of n hasn't played like this state of n hasn't played any role. These are just the size of the problem. Okay, so next we want to compute WK. This is work done at level K. Well, so we have how many subproblems at level k? Four to the k times the work. Um, by work, I mean non recursive work done within okay. each subproblem. And this is where this data comes in. So the work done within a subproblem is linear in the, in the size of the input to that subproblem. So in our case, it's theta of the size of that subproblem. Now at level k, uh, or depth k, the size of subproblem is n over 2k. So put n over 2k here. 
Um, I'll say, I'll, I'll replace level with depth just so I'm using the same word, but it, it mean, means the same thing. Okay. So this, I can just take the two to the K out and then do the division and that's two to the K theta of N. Okay. Now, total work done over the whole tree. This is going to be W equals to now the sum of the work done at each level over all the possible levels. And this is where we use that they're log N possible levels or the height is log N. That's the setup. From here on out, now we're just going to do algebra. Okay, so we plug in into this sum what we have derived for WK. Oops. Now the sum, uh, the variable in the summation is K, and theta N doesn't depend on that variable. So we can take it out of the sum. Now this here, this is a geometric series. Remember, let me take you back to the, to this thing that we covered. So, Geometric series looks like this. It's a function where you have some base in the expo uh, base of the exponent C uh, raised to the power of I, where I ranges from zero to some upper bound. That's exactly what we have over there. We just have using different variable names. We're our variable is k that's we're going over, and it's not going up to n, it's going up to log n. The value of C is two. Right? So uh, because the value of C is two there, we fall into this category and we know what G of N is. It's theta C to the N in, in, in this terminology, but N is just the upper index here. So it's the, it would be C in that case two, the power of the upper index which is log n. So if you didn't quite follow that, just go back after class, look a little carefully at that geometric series and plug it in into here. Now this is just theta n times theta n, because two to the power of log n is uh, n, which is theta n squared. So t of n equals theta n squared. This is the total work done, number of steps by log. It's good news and bad news. What's what's the what's the bad news? We're still at theta of n squared. What's what's the what's the good news? We learned the recursion tree technique for proving a, a recursion relation. Um, so next time you see it, it'll be a second example. All right. Well, uh, hopefully I didn't waste all your time giving you an algorithm that's not much faster. Well, that's not not faster than the one you learned in in grade school. Um, and the reason we do it this way is because this algorithm is actually not that far from being faster. We need to just do a bit of a tweak to it. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's a tweak. It's an, again, an algebraic tweak. So bear with me as I, as I derive some, um, another formula 
I'm going to derive another formula for xy that looks like this, but instead of using one, two, three, four multiplications, it's going to use only three multiplications. All right, so let's see what happens. Let's define P3. Well, let, let me remind you, P1. Uh, yeah, so P1, let me remind you, is XL times YL. P2 is XR times YR. Let me define P3 as XL plus YL times xr plus yr, and you'll see why that's useful in a second. Um, let's write this out, just distribute the multiplication, xl times yl plus xr times yr plus x uh, plus xl yr plus x r y l and this is equal to p1 plus p2 plus x l y r plus x r y l let's now bring this guy now this guy is interesting by the way because remember this is the term that appeared in here let me copy this so you can see it. Remember that this was the equation for x times y that we derived. And we had we didn't like this part this meant we had to do two multiplications so now notice that it's the same as this one so i'm going to write i'm going to rewrite our equation to say x l y r plus x r y l is equal to p1 plus p2 minus p3 right i just took p3 brought it over to this side and took this guy and move it over to the left. Now let's put this in here. This is 2 to the n, p1 plus 2 to the n over 2, p1 plus p2 minus p3 plus p2. All right. So now notice that we will need to do one multiplication to get P1, one multiplication to get P2, and just one multiplication to get P3. So hopefully that will give us a faster algorithm. Let's write down the algorithm mult3xy so we have it precisely. Uh, this time I'm going to be precise and add a base case. So if n, the number of bits, is less than or equal to 64, then return x times y. In other words, we're just going to use the compiler, the machine multiplication, because these are just ints now, x and y. They're, if each is less than 64 bits, these are just ints. So we don't have to make any recursive call. That's the base case. Um, Otherwise, we're going to compute P1 recursively, mult 3 XL YL P2 equals to mult 3 X right times Y right, and P3 equals to mult 3, whatever we had up there, XL plus YL XR plus YR. And now we're going to return 2 to the n p1 plus 2 to the n half p1 plus p2 minus p3 plus p2. And that's our new algorithm. 
Um, so same, same kind of structure as the previous one, but we did a little algebra to make sure we're only doing one of these multiplications or recursive multiplications. Here's an algorithm. Now, what do we do with algorithms? Correctness, running time, and can we do that? Those are the three questions. Correctness, well, I just derived the correctness uh, right now, just before even presenting the algorithm. So now let's do the running time. Um, the running time is similar to before. So we have some recursive calls one, two, three recursive calls, each one of size n over two. So these are all n half bits. Notice that this is also n half bits because you're just adding the two halves. Maybe it's n half plus one. Maybe you need an extra bit because you're adding, um, but it's still about n half bits. We put in half. What about the work that we do inside the function? It's still the same. We're still doing a, well, we're doing addition, 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 subtraction, addition. It's just the constant number of addition, subtractions, and the same two shifts. So still the same theta n time. Okay. You think this one will do better than theta n, n squared, or you think I'm just messing with you again and we're just going to be at n squared for many lectures? Yeah. Yeah, because we're only doing three recursive calls, mole three. Yeah, before, here's explicitly, let's look at before, we had one, two, three, four. We had to do these two guys. Now we kind of got around doing them. Now people often will ask, like, "Oh, what's the intuition? Like, why? How did? How did you think of doing uh, of doing it like this? Who would come up with writing it out this way to get less multiplication?" Uh, I don't have the intuition, and you know, sometimes the like the nice, the clever algorithms. You can understand why they work. You can prove why they work. But like, do you really get like the intuition of like, oh, you could have designed this algorithm yourself? Sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes it's only the people that work on this for you know many years, do research on this. They, they will have the intuition. Um, but others maybe don't. And that's fine. That's fine. Sometimes you get the intuition by you first under, you first just understand proof of why it's correct. And maybe over time, it kind of sinks in uh, why it's correct. When I learned, for example, calculus, I remember the definition of, uh, of a derivative, and it has this kind of limit. I forget, there's a delta, there's an epsilon in that definition, and there's an order of the quantifier. So there exists a epsilon such that for all delta, and not the other way around. So, you know, I understood how to apply that definition in high school and whatever, 12th grade when we were learning it. It, it wasn't until like a couple of years later of taking advanced calculus and it kind of hit me. Like, that's why you have to do it in that order and not in a different order. Like, I finally got the intuition for the definition of a derivative. Not, and it wasn't the year I learned it. It was much later. So it's kind of like a natural learning process at least for difficult things. Other things, you like for many other things in this class, you will be able to have, to get the intuition uh, right away. Like, like the Fibonacci number bottom up, hopefully you got the intuition of why that's bad. Okay, enough, uh, enough uh, storytelling. Let's solve this uh, recursion relation and hopefully get something better than N squared. So uh, we start, with a uh, n here, then what do we have? We have three problem instances, uh, sub problems. 
each of size n over two. And each of those has their own and so on. Okay, so let's look at the depth of this tree. Again, I mean, it's, it's a similar tree. The only difference is the branching factor. So the depth is still, um, we're, we're still dividing by half each time. So it's going to be log n before we get to the bottom. Sorry, not the depth, the height of the tree. Uh, branching factor. Here it's three. Um, number of. Um, Number of sub problems k here again k equals zero is the top one k equals one k equals two and then so on. Um, how many sub problems with depth k? Three to the three to the k. Same logic as before. We start one, three, nine, twenty-seven, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So these n over two is a mistake. It should be n over four because at n over two, we after that we half the input again for the next level of recursion. Great, thank you. Um, now the size of subproblems at depth k is actually the same as before. It's n over two to the k. We half each time at each. Each new depth we have. Okay, so now let's do the math. So the work at level K is number of subproblems at level K, right? Three to the K times the work done in each subproblem. Now the size of the subproblem is N over 2K. And the work done. Non-recursive work done is linear in the size of the subproblem. So it's just going to be theta of that. Right. And this is 3k over 2k theta n. And this is 3 half, 3 halves to the k theta n. Right. Now we are ready to define the work. Total work, so we're summing over all the levels, all the depths uh, of the work at that depth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so because it's theta n, that means that the work if that means that the subproblem size is n over 2k, then the work is linear in that size. So it's theta n over 2k. So the work at level k is the number of subproblems at level k times the work done at each of those subproblems. Uh, the work, so what is the work done at? at in, in this function, it is linear in the input size of that subproblem. Okay. So this theta n is this, there's an n here, and this is a theta n. Now, in the case of when you go down level to level k, this is no longer n, this is n over 2 to the k. So 
the work done is there is theta n over two to the third, and that's what I put in here. Any questions? All right, so from here on out, again, it's it's going to be just algebra. Um, so k zero to log n three half to the k theta n. We can take the theta n out of the sum. This now is again, this is a geometric series. just like before, but before instead of three halves, we had a two. Three halves is still more than one. So we're still in that case where that geometric series evaluates to theta. Then you take the, the base and raise it to the power of the highest index, in this case, log Now, what do you do with this guy? Well, when you see log n in the exponent, you can, there's a way to bring it down. Um, we saw uh, an um, identity we could use for that. This one, let me copy it. To recall this identity. So some a to the power of log base b of n is equal to n log base b of a. And so here a equals three halves, b is the base of the log, it's two, and then so three halves to the log base two of n is equal to n to the log base two of three halves. Which is n to the log base two of three minus log base two of two, which is n to the log three minus one. Bring that back here and write theta n times theta n to the log three minus one. And now we bring the n's together, theta n times n log three minus one equals to theta n log three. And log three, log base two of three is um, n to the 1.59. We beat n squared. So you might have gotten lost in the trees and forgot the force. We were, remember, just deriving the total work. And we wrote down you know, what the recursion tree gave us. This was just algebra. We, we solved it, and its total work is theta n to the 1.59. Yeah. All right, so what's next? What do we ask always? Can we improve it? What do you guys think? Is there any faster algorithm than this? I 
How many of you think that there is a faster algorithm than this? How many of you don't think that this is the best? How many of you just like, I, I don't know, how would I know? Um, okay, so yes, there is a faster algorithm than this, but we it's beyond really the scope of this class. In fact, it's a, uh, a very recent result in 2019. Uh, someone um, came up with uh, order n log n algorithm. This is really a groundbreaking result because it's, I mean, if you think about all the problems we study in computer science, multiplication is kind of, kind of basic, right? That's really, really a fundamental problem and um, you know we just had a breakthrough uh, on the algorithm now yeah question if the you said if the amount of done of work done at each level i mean that's that It was like n to the four. Well, like, yeah, so then everything would rise, but the work, it still would be the sum of all that. So for example, if this was n to the four, then summing from zero to log n would give us n to the four log n. So we're still, the work at that level, at each level, um, would still need to sum over all the levels. Here's a, a fun Penn State fact. Uh, before this algorithm came out, so from 2007 to 2019, the fastest algorithm for multiplication was given by professor here at Penn State, Martin Fuhrer. You might, if you take 464, he, he often teaches 464, so you might take that with him. Uh, he had for a long time the fastest algorithm for this problem until, until 2019. So it was a little bit, you know, I was, I've been teaching this class since 20, 2013, I've been telling students, hey, the fastest algorithm for multiplication is due to Professor Fuhrer here at Penn State. I was kind of disappointed when these people came up with a faster algorithm because I could no longer say that, but I figured I can still squeeze it in. It's still, it's still, we still have the record during those years. <laughs> okay, so, um, Like I mentioned, this is the, the multiplication is kind of a gateway now for having, for being able to solve these recurrences. There is a more elegant way to solve these recurrences called Master's Theorem. Um, Master's Theorem assumes that you have an algorithm whose runtime can be expressed in the form P of N equals to A, so some number A times T of N over B, so number B plus big O of N to some number D, where these numbers, so A has to be more than one. No, sorry, it has to be more than zero. Um, in practice, I think we'll, it will always be more than one, no. Uh, B 
has to be more than one and D has to be at least zero. And so we've seen this multiplication algorithm is an example of an algorithm that fits this bill. It can be expressed like this, meaning that um, you have some recursion and some non-recursive work. There's non-recursive work. The non-recursive work is bounded by some polynomial of n whose degree is d. Okay. The recursion, well, we have a recursive calls. In the multiplication, last multiplication example, a was three. And each time we divide the subproblem by b, the size of the subproblem grows smaller by b. Last time b equals equal to two. So not all algorithms fit this mold, but a certain category of algorithms does. These are called divide and conquer algorithms. We'll get back to them at the end of the lecture and spend a couple of lectures on them. Okay, so, okay, what does the master theorem tell us? So um, if this is the form, then T of N can be solved exactly and it's one of three cases it's either o of n to the d o of n to the d log n or o of n to the log base b of a and we're going to have three cases now for the to, to figure out which case we're going to be in we're going to have to compare d to log base B of A. Okay, we'll see examples. Uh, so you guys get comfortable with this, but for example, if D is more than this, then we go into case one, we'll call this case one. If D is equal to this, then we go into case two. And if D is less than this, then we're in, in case three. Okay, so the master theorem, basically, if you have a recursion in this form, you don't have to do the recursion tree. You can apply the master theorem to right away get an answer. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's see, let's look at an example. Uh, let's do the one we just covered. So t of n equals to 3t of n over 2 plus o of n. For now, we'll just work with a big O here. We'll put o of n, not a theta. Okay, so here, what do we have? We have here, this is a equals 3. This is b equals 2. And this is d equals 1, n to the power of 1. Oh, we've got log base b of a now is equal to log base two of three. This was like one, what was it? 1.59, that's right, just 1.6. And this is bigger than d, which is in this case one. So we are in, d is smaller, so we're in case three. Case three says that T of N is equal to O N to the log base B of A, which is approximately O of N to the 1.6. That's exactly what the recursion tree method gives. Let's do another example. So let's do the, the one from before. So four T of N over two, plus O of N, this, is, this was if we had four recursive calls. So now A equals three, B equals two, and D equals one. Let's see, log base B of A equals to log base, oh, A equals four. 
log base two of four equals to two, and that is bigger than D, which is one. So we're still in case three. T of N equals to O of N log base V of A, which is O of N squared. Yeah, so there, well, there are two versions of master theorem. I'll write the second one in a minute. The first one gives you the answer in terms of big O. The second version gives you in terms of big theta. Uh, it, you know, I'll skip ahead. So if this is, oops, if this is O, then we have O here. If, if this were theta, then the theta would carry over to this one. Okay, that's the basic idea. I'll, I'll elaborate in a, in a minute. Okay, let's do another example. T of N equals to T of N over two plus O of one. Do you guys know any way of any algorithm that has this type of running time? Yeah. Binary search, right? Yeah. We, in binary search, you make one recursive call. Right? So, a equals one, you go either left half or right half. So you reduce the problem size by two and you actually don't do any non-recursive work. I mean, you, you do some constant comparisons and that's, that's it. So here, one is a polynomial of degree zero, right? Remember this, n to the zero is one. Okay, so let's see. You guys should, you know, you know how long binary search takes, so you, you can probably guess what we'll get here, but let's, let's see what the master theorem gives us. Log base B of A is log base two of one equals to zero, which is equal to D, which is zero. So this is the case when the two guys are equal to each other, and that's case two, in which T of N equals to O, N to the D log, n, but d here is zero, so this is just o log n. And that's the binary search you know and love. Um, let's, do, let's do one with case one. Let's do another one. Uh, t of n equals to two t n over two plus O of N squared. Here, A equals two, B equals two, and D equals two. So log base B of A is log base two of two equals to one, which is less than D, which is two. This takes us to case one, where D is the large one is case one in where T of N is big O of N to the D, which is O of N squared. Let me, yeah. D, it doesn't, D, so what is D here? Like, is there an intuitive explanation for D? It's not such a straightforward intuitive explanation as A and B. But D is, where D is coming from is that the non-recursive work is big O of some polynomial function. D is the degree of that polynomial function. So if, like, here, uh, like here, D would be one. It's the, because N is the polynomial of degree one. So it's the, the degree of this polynomial. Let, let me write now master theorem version two. This is not in your book, uh, but it's the same one, but with, with theta. So if, 
of n equals to a p of n over b plus theta n to the d, then I'm just going to copy this. Right. So the only thing I'm going to do is turn these state in these uh, uh, O's into thetas. Now, for example, uh, if we have this mult three recurrence. Um, we can write that this is theta of n to the one point six. Okay, now, like uh, you might ask, why why did we learn the recursion tree if we have the master theorem? Because master theorem, right, it's kind of it's much faster to apply if you can apply it than, than the recursion tree. Well, if I just taught you the master theorem, you'd just think it's pure magic. Like, okay, this somehow magically can solve this. But actually, the master theorem, it, the proof of the master's theorem just follows a recursion tree argument. In fact, in, in uh, other versions of this class, um, they sometimes cover the proof of the master theorem. It's not that complicated. It's basically doing the recursion tree, but you know, keeping these, like considering all possible values for the, for the branching factor, right? This is the branching factor or the, the problem size. So, um, the master theorem just basically formalizes, automates what you would be able to get from a recursion. And so even though it's easier to use, like right now, you, you know, you know, it's not magic. It's just behind this theorem is just a recursion tree argument of the kind that you learn. It's just, you don't have to do, the, do it every time from scratch. You can just uh, like uh, automate it uh, and write down there. Oh, is there any cases that it doesn't work? You pretty much took me to the next, uh, led me into the next uh, thing I wanted to say. Um, yes, there are cases when this doesn't work. If your algorithm doesn't fit this bill, then it doesn't work. Obviously, if your algorithm is non-recursive, then it doesn't fit this, oh dear. Then it doesn't fit this bill. But even if your algorithm is recursive, it doesn't necessarily follow like this. So for example, um, for example, what if T of N equals two uh, T of N minus one plus N? You, this is not N over B. You're not reducing the input by some fraction. You're just reducing it by one. So you cannot express it like this. Master theorem does not apply here. Um, but we can solve this in another way. We can, it's called uh, unrolling, un, hold on a second, unrolling technique. Um, so we basically just keep on plugging in the the values. Um, okay, so let me write it out like this. Let me put t of n minus one. Just switch the order. And now, what is t of n minus one? Well, uh, you know, we just use the definition of the of the of t of n. It's just 
you reduce the input size by one for a recursive call and add whatever the input size was. So t of n minus one is t of n minus two, oops, uh, is n minus one plus t of n minus two. So we're just applying this, but with n minus one. And we repeat. So t of n minus two, we unroll that as well. And that becomes n minus two plus t of n minus three. And let, let's say you should have a base case that t of one equals one. Um, so we keep on unrolling until you start to see what the pattern is. So n, n minus one, n minus two, it's basically gonna be that until we get to one. Plus dot, 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 plus two, plus one. And this, if you remember, is just the sum i equals one to n of i. And we saw this is, uh, well, you can write it out if you want. Uh, and remember, this was a polynomial of degree two. Here, this one, we didn't, we couldn't solve using the master theorem, um, but we solved it using the the unroll this unrolling technique. Right. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, what? Oh, how do you, well you 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 start to see the pattern. So you you have n and minus one. You have n and minus one and minus two. So in the end you get uh let me add let me add another step to maybe clear make it clear. We get n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus two, 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 two plus t of one. So eventually, if you follow this pattern, n minus two, n minus three, eventually it's going to get to two and one. And then we plug in the base case t of one equals to one. And our result. Questions? Okay, so this is, I think this is it for solving, for how to solve recurrence relations. You should now have what you need um, for the next homework. For the rest of the class. I want to now go back to what I mentioned earlier, which is divide and conquer algorithms. The divide and conquer algorithms are the type of algorithms that whose running time would result in, in this uh, recurrence relation that fits the master theorem. Um, divide and conquer algorithm, the first one is this, the first one we saw is this multiplication algorithm mult three and mult two. The idea of a divide and conquer algorithm is to first break problem into smaller subproblems. That's what we did. We 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 with multiplication we broke it up this problem multiplying two n bit numbers we define some subproblems that multiply to n half bit numbers, so smaller subproblems. Okay. Then we recursively solved those subproblems. Okay, then we had to combine, combine those solutions. In our case, with multiplication, we had, uh, let's see, this was the combined step. We had to do some additions and some shifts. We combined the recursive 
the recursive solutions into the final answer. This is the general structure of a divide and conquer algorithm. Um, do you guys know of any other divide and conquer algorithms that you've covered in, in merge sort? Yeah, and we're going to go over merge sort in detail here as, a, as an example. Okay. I think most of you have seen merge sort, right? Um, so this shouldn't this should be kind of an intuitive algorithm. Um, we'll we'll go through it and explain. Um, yeah, and, and, and sort of explain how it how it can be viewed as a divide and conquer algorithm. So your input here is an array of n numbers. Uh, let's call it A one through N. And your output is a sorted version of A. For example, uh, we'll work with this example later. So if your input is 10, two, uh, two five, three, seven, 13, one, six, then your output should be one, two, three, five, six, seven, 10, 13. So the idea here for a divide and conquer algorithm, well, the, the first question, how do we divide? Well, in sorting, it's there's a natural way, which is we divide the, the vector, uh, the array A in two halves, we sort the left half separately and we sort the right half separately. So um, let's, let's suppose we've sorted the two halves. Uh, the two halves will denote as A1 through N over two. And we'll put a floor here in case N is odd. And the right half, n over two plus one until n. Suppose we've sorted this, how do we combine, how do we merge them together? Yeah. Okay, so let's see what that looks like uh, in A. All right, we have, this is the left half, this is the right half. So uh, we have uh, sorted two, three, five, 10. And we've sorted the right half. Okay, so let's do, how do we merge the two? Now, uh, I mean, obviously we can merge the two, but the point is we wanna keep the running time low. Uh, for example, yeah, well, so we wanna, we wanna do this in linear time. We wanna do this merge step in linear time. If we do it in linear time, so if merge takes theta n, then the running time is going to be t of n equals to, so two recursive calls, one for each half, and the size of each recursive call is half plus theta n. Was this one of our examples by any chance? No. So, but let's let's do it. So, what this is, a equals to two, b equals to two, b equals to one. So, log base b of a equals to log base two of two equals two one, which is equal to d. This is, this is case two and case two, T of N equals to theta uh, N to the D log N, which in this case, D is one. So it's just theta N log N. So we'll have, 
if we can do the merge in data and time, then we'll have uh, n log n time algorithm. Um, so how do we do the merge in linear time? Does anyone remember it from previous classes? Which class did you guys learn about merge sort in 132? This is a long time ago. Or did you guys not, did you cover the merge procedure? So and so. You covered it or you, and you don't remember it? Or you didn't cover it? Okay, well. We'll cover it here. So um, the idea is I keep two pointers. Um, give ourselves some space. So initially, the two pointers point to the beginning. I put in the output the smaller of those two values. So I put one. And then I move the pointer to the right. And then I, so this guy is no longer here. Now I again compare the values of the two pointers and I take the smallest of them, two, and I move that pointer to the right. Compare them again, I write the smallest and move that pointer to the right. Take the smallest again, the five and six, move that pointer to the right. Take the smallest of those, that's six. Move that pointer to the right. Take the smallest of seven and 10, that's seven. Move that pointer to the right. Take the smallest of 10 and 13, that's 10. Move that pointer to the right, so now that's the end of that. And so I'm just left with 13. Okay, and then now I'm done. Uh, right, and this, this was a linear time. If you just follow it along, this uh, uh, intuitively should be linear time, but we'll, we'll prove it in a second. Uh, let's write down the, the pseudocode for this. So the merge will be linear time. So the merge procedure, that's the one that conquers, that's the one that combines the results. The merge sort will be n log n time. Right. So th this is this here, this is the time of the merge part. This is the time of the sort, because the, the merge is non-recursive. The merge is just this linear uh, algorithm. So for the merge, We'll define it as taking two arrays, one of size K, one of size L. It doesn't, because it doesn't, uh, um, well, well uh, let me write it down. So we're going to actually define it recursively, because if you notice the way we did it, I mean, we could, we could describe what we did iteratively, but you could also describe what we did recursively, which is we took, we, we took the smallest. Remember, we, we started with pointers here. In other words, we started with these arrays. We took the smallest first element, one. And then you could say we made a recursive call to ourselves with these arrays. So we, we took the one out of the, the lower array. And now again, we compare the two first ones. We take the lower one out and we make a recursive call to those guys. So that's another way to, to write this uh, down. The base case is when one of this arrays is empty. So for example, at some point we got to the point where this is just it's empty and we still had left in here, uh, this guy. So those are base cases. If 
k is equal to zero, so the first array is empty, then we return the rest, the, the y array. There's nothing to merge that by itself is already merged because we're merging with nothing in that case. And equivalently, if L is zero, then we return the X array. See, I'm out of time, so we'll pick up next time. <laughs>